So uh, my name is Mike Spanbauer. Uh, of course, I work for Juniper Networks. So I am the field CTO for security. And my partner in crime up here today is... I'm Crystal Portacrero. I also work at Juniper Networks. Um, but <laughs> so as a product manager covering all of our data center technologies in cloud. So the topic today is the next generation elephant in the room. It's a bit of play on, of course, words with respect to the securities industry uh, want to, you know, name generationally, right, various things. But specifically, we're going to dive into one area that has been a challenge for, for many organizations. So really quick, before we get into the presentation itself, standard disclaimer, right, RSA makes us include this slide. I'm sure you've seen it for any of the sessions you've been in today. So. Uh, check the, the liability box. <laughs> so we're going to discuss, right? So, you know, why is securing an organization, you know, so difficult? And, and yes, right, there's, there's a lot of aspects to this, but uh, we're going to double click into a couple of them and then go through, right, uh, you know, some of the symptoms and issues, what's led us here, and speak more about what really next generation firewalls have been expected to do, how they've grown over time, and then uh, from there, right, figure out uh, and offer uh, guidance and paths to uh, you know, this concept of zero trust, right? It's not a product, it's a principle set, and specifically, it's not even a destination because it's a journey that you continue on throughout your organization's development and risk management cycles. And lastly, right, managing this, the ops teams, the men and women that are responsible for tuning, configuring, deploying, and ultimately securing the organization, and how that plays a role so critically in achieving these positive outcomes. So let's just start off with, you know, the problem, right? And zero trust would be easy, if only. <laughs> and I think it's one of those things, you know, we're really good at technology. You walk around the floor, you go into all of these talks, you see really interesting, right, um, new types of technology, every type of new threat, there's a new widget to protect against that specific type of threat. And if technology was really the whole issue, I think we would have solved it by now, honestly. But a lot of times where the problem comes in is where technology meets people. And I am a huge XKCD fan, and I think cryptography also is a really good use case, right? We can, we've been doing cryptography for hundreds of years. Even before computers existed, we were doing cryptography. And now in the compute age, we do cryptography, we add larger keys, we do perfect port secrecy, we have right, key management services to keep everything secure. And so yes, in theory, it's very hard to actually crack that encryption. But the reality is you hit somebody on the head with a $5 wrench and you can get their password. You can send them an email with a $50 free Amazon gift card and you get their password. So it's not just about the technology. The technology is great. It's sometimes everything else around it. Indeed. <laughs> and it's also about, again, thinking outside the box, right? Recognizing that this is not just a single path to success. Your organization's unique challenges present the hurdles that you need to deal with day in and day out, right? And so, you know, technology is also, as Crystal noted, right, not just, you know, pieces in there. This is the marketing spin and, and the joke, and of course, yeah. I mean, I don't know why security is an industry that is so fraught with marketing. <laughs> just constant marketing, you know, next gen 2.0 AI powered, you throw out every single word every time you see something. And what does it even mean, right? <laughs> I think it's kind of uh, an insult to practitioners. Like we say, next gen firewall, we've been using them for 10, almost 15 years. Is it really next gen or is it last gen? You know, the 2.0 thing that I'm about to deploy, well, that's a whole new paradigm shift and we have to do the 2.0 version of ZTNA, but I, I haven't even finished my 1.0 rollout. <laughs> like, and now you're telling me I have to do something else? And so you start assimilating right, all of the products into this really, you know, just marketing speak. And AI specifically is like one of my pet peeves. Everything nowadays is fortified with AI. And I think it's really kind of funny, because if you think about what fortified actually means, so if you go back, and I'm a big history buff, so you go back in time to like the turn of the century, and the Industrial Revolution. We invented uh, the Beale Germinator, right? And what that allowed us to do is, right, as a civilization is we started, you know, everybody's working in factories, so we're not spending as much time in the fields, we're not spending as much time cooking, we need ready-made sustenance. 
So we're able to make white flour very quickly. You de-germ, right? You get rid of the germ for the, from the wheat as well as the hull. Same thing with corn. So we can produce food much faster. But in doing so, we killed all the nutritional value. The nutritional value is in the germ. Right? So then we have to go through and fortify our cereals, fortify right, everything with vitamin B, with vitamin C. Otherwise, you get things like rickets. And uh, was it pellagra was another big issue right, <laughs> right around the time. Scurvy, right? You're pulling the nutritional value because we're moving technology so far forward and not really thinking of the unintended side effects. Now, what does this have to do right, with security? I think AI is one of their sayings. It's not a panacea. It actually has downsides to it, right? It's not gonna solve every single problem. It, a lot of times it's just marketing, right? It's machine learning. It's sometimes it's just automation or logic. But we sell it as AI because that's what sells more product. But think about why you use the technologies. Well, and of course, <laughs> if you've attended any of the other sessions, right? Of course, ChatGPT is, is in every session, I think, or maybe it is every other session. That said, Right, uh, you know the the benefits are are also numerous, but you know to the point Crystal just noted, we've arrived at today's next gen firewall after 15 years, and we've added an awful lot of stuff into it. Right, you think about how many different capabilities have been introduced as either service connections or on box capabilities over the last you know 15 years since the concept was introduced. Well, I mean we're at what fifth generation, sixth generation. You know, if you follow the next gen moniker, right? It'd be next, 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 next gen firewall, <laughs> which you know we shortened to just next gen. But again, you know, the point is that it's grown over time additively, usually on a project by project basis, and customers have accumulated staff and approaches to uh, support that's this sprawl uh, in order to you know maintain and keep the lights on. Right? Because all the policies are different, and of course, you know, and I know you'll touch on this in a second, but you know, anyone who's ever worked through a data center firewall project knows that those rules, especially if they predate your tenure at the organization, you don't delete the rules unless you know with certainty what exactly it does. Because you don't want to be the guy or gal that takes out you know, the SAP, the, the database set, right? the, the connection to the NAS, whatever it is, as it ends up running considerable risk. That's where we're at. And when you look at also inclusion of cloud properties, the virtual firewalls running as an element of the risk model, right? The attack surface that an organization manages, <clears throat> you've ended up with a, a lot of both products, diverse policies, and incredible complexity that, that you've got to juggle, again, day in and day out in your roles to ultimately manage and secure the organization. So, a handful of questions uh, to tee up, right? The the path, you know, to these these mandates. Most organizations that I've spoken to over the last you know, three to five years have some measure of a target with respect to what they want to achieve, you know, around zero trust or or the concept of zero trust, right? Especially, you know, the U.S. and and actually overseas, most government entities have instituted some model of the NIST initial framework. Now, of course, you know, the cybersecurity framework is advanced again, which is great, right? It's sort of a recipe to a degree as to how to think about the problem set, but the practical application of those concepts and getting to that destination is often quite a struggle. So, you know, how do you manage your data center influences this, right? Where and what are those cloud firewall policies? Which clouds? You know, the the end user, uh, application, you know, permissions, access, control, partners, right? You know, these series of questions all set the stage for uh, you know, the conversation around what is it exactly you want to achieve as an outcome to zero trust. And I think that's one of the other really important things. I think it's one of the reasons why zero trust has become po so popular. It's not just about the technology set. Right. It's really for you to look at how is your right how is your entire security practice how is it actually helping the business right is it actually helping you achieve your end goals right as a company by having things be more secure and it could be something as simple as i don't want to see as many mfa pop-ups every time i have to sign into something that's a better user experience so you can measure it in different ways user experience uh, 
actual internal users. It could be also your right, user experience for your end users, right? You're using your application, making sure it's up, available, you can push new features to production much faster. And then, of course, there's always security efficacy as another measurement. And I think one of my favorites is also around just security simplicity. Can you make it more simple? We're really good at making things more complicated. I need new, again, types of security controls for every new place I go into. But is it actually necessary, or can you use what you have more effectively? Right. And, you know, I think ultimately, as the title implies, right, the destination for most orgs that I've spoken with now, it's, it's you know, zero trust is part of that, right? That's, that's an end state ideal if, if you're lucky enough to be able to both map and achieve it. But in addition, maintaining or, or doing more with the staff and investments and the operations teams that you have, because oftentimes, again, that sprawl has led to complexity that frankly, challenges most teams day in and day out. So let's double click back to the next gen elephant, the concept of the firewall specifically, you know, what, what is, you know, the firewall and that distributed diverse complex policy set have to do with this. So you know, really this concept of operationalizing, you know, security is around being able to normalize the policy control set and know with persistent visibility how it's behaving both on property whether that's data center or campus right remote users may have uh, an individual uh, firewall control uh, in the form of you know ZTNA or, or even a small firewall if they're <laughs> been, been remote for a while uh, cloud properties right Amazon you know Azure uh, GCP OCI right whichever cloud instance you're in Right? You're going to have virtual capabilities, right? Your Kubernetes clusters, right? So containers, all of these different policy sets and enforcement mechanics. Well, they challenge our teams more than they challenge the attackers <laughs> because at the end of the day, knowing that they're behaving according to intent and that the operations teams are able to tune, identify, and, and witness whether there's a threat attempt or an attack or, or, or a potential you know, vector subject to uh, weakness, right? Ultimately, these are where, um, you know, the, the actors are, are looking for those holes, right? So this is what's occurred, how we've, you know, sprawled into this pain. And the solution is, of course, easy to speak to, right? I can stand up here and I can, you know, preach that ultimately, if you had visibility across all of the policy sets and the infrastructure with, continuity plus you know you're able to tune policies where regardless of how they're instituted wherever they're deployed and uh, being able to ensure that they behave the same for a specific application or behavioral role that's ultimately uh, a key to gaining back a lot of time and and so I've spoken with a lot of customers who have achieved this so it is possible and they're able to spend considerably less staff time and well energy on that capability so yeah, and so one of the really great hard things is as you're looking to adopt new architectures whether that's a cloud first policy and you're moving into somebody else's cloud from your own kind of data center or you're trying to adopt like a sassy type architecture or just move like into zero trust these are all new things you're trying to do but again from the operations side you spend more time than just keeping the lights on. And so how do you keep one foot in, like, again, the past, keeping the lights on, making sure everything is running and up and available, and still push these new initiatives? So it's always this hard balancing act because you have different technology sets. You're really starting to bifurcate, and we have the cloud team doing one side of things, and the campus right edge side doing one side of things, and then what's happening from all your remote workers using another set of technologies. And without something there to really provide that bridge, right, that gives you the visibility, that gives you the control at each of those points, it becomes much more difficult. So instead of thinking about it at all these different areas, again, what can kind of help you in providing that unified kind of policy set? How do I transition from one architecture to another? Can I simply just change my policies? You know, is there an easy way to? Right, right from the management side of things, just move it forward. 
So I'm not spending as much time, right? You don't have to spend as much time in your day on all of these new things. It's taking the old and just switching them slightly, right? Updating them. But that single unbroken piece of visibility in all of the places is kind of key to making that transition. So you're transitioning at the pace that makes sense for you and your organization instead of because your technology is forcing you down a specific path. So. And then, you know, and when you think about zero trust, uh, one of the hard things about it, right, is, is again, you know, think about the first time, like right when you got out of school, your very first job, or maybe after you took a certification test, you have all of this theory. How much of that actually goes into practice? Right, half of that goes out the window. And it's, it's because, right, there, there's reality. Yes, in a perfect world, we would do exactly this. But the reality is the business has to keep running. You need your users to connect to your applications. Otherwise, nobody's making any money. And why else are you in business? And so you think about zero trust. How are we moving, right, to this kind of new architecture? And what you end up with is a huge, massive sprawl, right? In theory, we're going to create micro perimeters around every important asset. That could be a user, right? it could be infrastructure, it could be a device, it could be a workload, an application, right? You have all of these different things you now need to protect. But as you create these micro perimeters, what is controlling what's going in and out of them, right? You need to be explicit, right? Trust nothing. Zero trust, right? And so you end up with this sprawl, and then all of those policy enforcement points have to be managed. You have to keep those policies not only consistent, but continuously, right? That's the other half, right, of zero trust. Is it's not just a set and forget like we used to do when you have like 5,000 policies now on your one firewall. Instead, what you're trying to do now is continuously, right, adapt. So you need something that's taking in all of that information, right, from logs, from your threats, what's happening, right, in general right across the world and across the threat landscape. You need to take in all of it as input, automatically then adjust, right, your policies based off of that. So that policy decision point, right, is really crucial. That's the brains of your entire operation. I mean, it's the same thing we, you know, did when separating the control plane and the data plane almost. You need something to control everything and make that possible. Otherwise, again, it all starts to fall apart. So <clears throat> before I dive into, you know, the, the concept that I think uh, has begun to emerge as an answer for this, right, I want to set a couple, you know, sort of expectations that I have, right, as a practitioner, right, as a pragmatic security guy, you know, it, your technology, you know, should not introduce additional complexity unless the outcome or value is, of course, greater. So when it comes to central management, right, this is your portal, your control, your ability to access and ensure that the behavior of your firewalls in this case, but just in general, does what it's supposed to do. So in this world, right, you need to have visibility across all of the traffic, all the policies, all those behaviors, right? Any gaps in visibility, whether that be from your on-prem architecture, your existing data center, to your newly consumable uh, SSC or, or secure service edge, right? You know, cloud delivered service. Gaps in those visibility uh, windows, right? So having, having you know, misses um, radically complicates. So, so <clears throat> it'll create considerable issues. Uh, to both achieve that tuning outcome, but also just frankly, for, for ops sanity, right? I mean, those are the gaps that keep people up at night, right? <laughs> Where am I not covered? Where can I not see, you know, the behavior of the environment? Efficacy, of course, it's a security solution, right? If you have a mitigation technology that's supposed to see and appropriately act on behaviors that the organization doesn't want, right? In the case of threats or ransomware or, or you know, malicious intent, right? Um, any of those, right? You know, it, the box or the solution ought to do what it's supposed to do. And I know that that sounds a little bit, you know, yeah, of course, duh. But, you know, the fact is that a, a lot of solutions don't deliver on the claims made. Doing more with less, I mean, that's really, again, an outcome of the right operational tool sets for your organization, right? Tools that aren't more complex to manage than, again, the value that they provide you. And when we talk about hundreds of firewalls, you know, thousands of rules, right? potentially multiple clouds. And, and I know multi-cloud is this nirvana, but being able to manage consistently 
policies between various cloud properties is achievable. It's often done through, through heroics by most orgs today, but it is achievable. But doing that with less people, less time, less staff, ultimately leads to not just you know, costs from an economic benefit, but also time aspects, right? Ultimately saved resources is what you, know, you get back with, again, good central management. If your solutions, if your management tools aren't delivering on these requirements, on these capabilities, then you should challenge whether that's the right tools, you know, the right relationship for your organization. And it's one of those really important things. You should always trust, but verify, right? Everything goes back to the basics in security. I think we can tend to you know, wrap ourselves around technology and you know, everybody's interested in the you know, red team, what they're doing, new threats, right? How do you actually pull white malware apart or look at a specific exploit? How was it right, um, used in the wild? That's really interesting. I love reading about it. I think everybody does, right? But it's the blue team, the defenders that are working day in and day out that I talk with, with a lot of customers that they're struggling because there's just so much sprawl. And so really looking at how do you pull all of these pieces together? Because you're not just focusing on one thing and then setting it, forgetting it, and moving on, right? You have to constantly be kind of moving things around. Nobody's static anymore. No data is. No users are. So how do you really start to secure all of those different areas when you're using completely different technologies in every place? Exactly. Right? It just causes more of an operational burden. And how many heroes can you hire? <laughs> I, mean, there's a, I mean, you can read about any right, the statistic about the shortage of security professionals in the world. And so really, again, having that single place where you can kind of see everything, understand what's going on. It may not be perfect, but it at least gives you a place to start and right, continuously get better over time, improve your security posture, understand the risk better, whether it's on the campus, whether it's on right, the, you know, in, in the cloud, whether it's your data center, whether it's your workforce, right? They're all important, but how they work together, right? Because that user's gonna connect into your data center to get to an application. And now that application is moving to somebody else's cloud, you still need to con you know, connect those two dots together and secure it end to end. As well as the users that are you know, connecting to your applications, where are they coming from? How much control do you have there? So you're looking at a slightly different way to do that, but you need to look at the end to end picture. Yeah, and, and to the point on this slide also, as Crystal just noted, right? You know, you've got the, the challenge in, in practically every organization of managing multiple architectures and ensuring that those protections are in place, right? Consistent is a bonus, right? But I think that that ultimately is where the biggest yield or benefit comes from uh, operational returns of a solution that doesn't work against your team right? and that actually works for you to achieve those outcomes. You know, as, as noted, Right? You know, the only constant in this world is change. And in the world of security, it's not, you know, it, it, there's no truer uh, statement, especially when it pertains to actors. And so I won't go too far down the whole proposal of uh, what, you know, chat GPT or generative AI or, or those tools may do from a threat context. But there's an awesome blog that was written by our Threat Labs organization um, that I'd encourage you to take a look at as a concept as to what's possible. And uh, let's just say that the you know, malware creation, the variant speed, and the ability to provide a tool for a fairly junior threat actor or, or malicious you know, individual uh, writing effective code and effective threats is unbelievably high now. And so if your architecture works against you, you can't keep up with those types of changes. And as noted, change is going to be continual. Tomorrow's architecture, we'll find out then, but you're gonna to need to adapt, adopt, and work towards deployment and consumption of it. And so that unified management piece in the center that provides that consistent policy, control, visibility, and ultimately consistent outcome is one of the critical things that I think gives organizations the best returns possible of any solutions right now available. So operationalizing this realized there's a concept that was recently coined um, in the last year or so by, by Gardner. It's called hybrid, uh, hybrid mesh security, right? And, and at its root, it's quite simple. It is a consistent policy structure 
deployed where appropriate throughout your environment, be it virtualized, containerized, physical, service-based, doesn't matter. But having that consistency and that capability to ensure that the policies follow the apps, the users, it follows the, um, the right enforcement mechanic to the enforcement point as Crystal walked you through. Right? And ultimately these are uh, means to achieve that zero trust concept at a network level and do so with a product or a solution, right? So, you know, being able to consistently, uh, if, you know, deploy these policies uh, across any app or any property, uh, any service, and knowing that it is both, well, again, behaving correctly, but also not just that, but uh, providing the troubleshooting, the visibility and, and the uh, event controls to ensure that you can take tuning actions. Because if you have event elements, parts, pieces in multiple consoles, multiple locations, then we're back to heroes and heroines trying to, you know, piece these puzzle elements together, right? And if you're dependent on the human element to bring these things together, well, that's quite a challenge, right? And so, you know, there's over a million open recs, the number just keeps going up. So all that does is it proves that we're not approaching the problem in the correct way. I think that simplicity in technology, deploying it correctly and being able to manage the next architecture versus spending over half of your ops team's time maintaining the existing is the way that we can change that dynamic, that outcome. And so just to, you know, kind of close and put a cap on this, you know, concept, right? You know, some of the simpler ways to get to this this hybrid mesh concept and achieve this outcome. Take a look, you know, over the next few months, right? You know, you should have an inventory of, of the controls that you have in place today, right? Determine where there's duplication or overlap and, you know, index who has the policy structures and capabilities that may be able to deliver on it. Now, basically doing this homework early when then you get to the refresh cycle time, right? The opportunity to invest in the next steps. Right? I would challenge that, you know, you should issue some hard questions to the vendors that you have. If you, you know, uh, plan to stay with them, right? Make certain that they're able to deliver, you know, critically ask them, how do you get to this, this hybrid mesh concept, this operational unification? Because, you know, regardless of the logo of, who's going to be that provider for you, right? These are where your biggest gains are to be had. This is where you'll return the most, you know, uh, resources and, and frankly get the best return on investment. And ultimately, right, you know, in six months to, you know, 12 months, you, know, you should already have an idea, of course, where the next refresh cycle will be so that you can prepare the conversations to potentially highlight that, you know, this investment returns enormous gains and, that it'll provide this operational, you know, I wouldn't, yeah, it's not simplicity, but it's operationally simpler <laughs> uh, solution to, to get to this, you know, destination. And, and, and these, you know, there's no one vendor, one, one question, one answer that can solve for all the zero trust requirements, but this will absolutely move the needle in respect to uh, the network control and visibility enforcement point aspects. So. Yeah, because I mean, you want to spend more of your time moving forward instead of just standing in the past. And I mean, there's so many things that have happened recently because the company chose not to right deal with technical debt or go through and simplify. They just kept adding to and adding to and saying, yeah, we'll get around to it. But that never happens. And so the more you can simplify, right, can you use what you have more effectively? Start just with the basics, then figure out what you can add on that's actually going to add again to the entire kind of architecture instead of bifurcating it more, right? Simplify and then add and figure out where those gaps are you need to kind of fill. <laughs> right. And so, uh, you know, with that uh, includes the presentation. So uh, there's a, you know, the QR code will take you to a trial if you want to play with our ops solution. But, you know, we'd love to have a conversation in the booth. Uh, or, of course, I'll stick around for a few minutes here afterwards since uh, we've got about, I think, 15 or so minutes left on the clock. Uh, but any questions? So now is your opportunity. Uh, grab a mic or, if, you know, you feel comfortable, 
just go ahead and belt it out.